We've created a world first, a biodiversity stewardship program. No one else in the world has done this. We are the first country in the world that can measure an improvement in biodiversity. We now have a voluntary marketplace to set up. We don't need a $2 billion fund that's been asked for the Australian taxpayer to kick the tin. They've kicked the tin for enough. It's time for corporate Australia to stand up and do their bit. And it's time to empower farmers to be part of this. A $100 million incentive in tax incentives for them to participate, not just in carbon, but biodiversity. And we've created a seal that they can put on their wheat, on their sheep, on their meat, on their wool, that gives them a market advantage, a premium that they will be paid for the biodiversity and the stewardship of their land. That's a world first. The smartest minds in Australia have created it, and we put our minds behind it and are backing it with money. Or it's the infrastructure. We're not just picking little regions. The biggest infrastructure spend in our nation's history is budgeted for $21 billion. Never before has the federal government invested so much, so much in regional Australia to fix the connectivity problems of $1.3 billion into telecommunications, making sure supply chains are fixed. $7.4 billion of that is to build dams, to equip our farmers with the tools to make money. We're just saying the states, you don't want to cut a cheque, that's OK. Just sign away the authority and let's start digging. It's time to empower our farmers with the tools they need. And we're committed to it. We know how to pay for it. You're going to pay for it by actually empowering you. That's how you repay debt. You don't lift taxes, you empower those that can do it. And we're empowering our new innovation systems, reforms that actually have put eight innovation hubs out in front of farmers so they'll adopt the technology. What a crazy idea, putting out the services in front of the people you want to adopt and use it. But we're also investing in our most precious asset, like Angus and his fiance. We're investing by reducing agricultural courses by 59%. We've already seen a significant increase in agricultural enrolments because of that. So we're thinking about the future and how we can bring the opportunity and hope, and that I can continue to leave a legacy, not for me, but for Australian agriculture. And today, the next step in leaving that legacy is I'm proud to announce a $75 million future farmers guarantee. This will guarantee loans of up to 40% of equity for new properties, for expansions, capped at a million dollars. This is about giving young people a go. This is about giving Angus a go. This is about giving him and his fiancée a start in regional rural Australia. To give a leg up, to be part of an industry, to have the opportunity and hope, not for corporates, but for family farms. They're the backbone of our regions. They're the backbones of our nation. And to give Angus and his fiancée a start, a guarantee, gives them the opportunity and hope that I hope leaves a legacy for Australian agriculture for generations to come. Thanks for having me. Julie Collins, thank you. Thanks, Lucy. And I also acknowledge my parliamentary colleague, David, uh, to the press club members here, to uh, ladies and gentlemen here, but also to the farmers and those at home watching in regional communities. I say thank you for tuning in today. As David has pointed out, uh, his government, the Morrison government, has been in government for almost a decade. And what do they leave as a legacy? Uh, David has obviously talked about some of the things that he's done, but we know that there are still some significant challenges. We know about the inaction on climate change. We know about the crippling workforce shortage. We know about the under-resourced biosecurity system and the severe timber shortage that we have in our country. To be frank, although the farmers are doing incredibly well due to world commodity prices and due to their hard work, and they have worked incredibly hard during the global pandemic, during bushfires, floods, and the mouse plague, as we heard from Fiona, uh, they have had a lot to deal with. But I think that many people are disappointed from some of the responses they've had from the government around some of those things. Indeed, the government established the $4 billion emergency response fund in 2019 to invest in disaster relief and mitigation, but we know, of course, that it's now barely spent a cent of that fund. 
And we know that despite all these challenges, the Morrison government has not been doing the work that it needs to do to sustain, sustainably transform the agriculture sector and work with other tiers of government and work with the industry and the sector to actually increase our long-term sustainability of agriculture in Australia. Indeed, what I'm hearing from people is, is that the Nationals and the Liberals have taken farmers and regional communities for granted. Their failure to drive the necessary reforms across the sector has impacted directly on those whose very livelihoods uh, rely on leadership at a national level. Indeed, uh, the almost decade-old government is still full of climate sceptics, has still failed to take real action on climate change. We know that there is the workforce shortage across agriculture but also other industries. We know that the biosecurity system has significant shortcomings. We've had report after report about it. The government can't deny the timber shortage that's impacting uh, us being able to build homes. We're importing timber now as a nation. The Liberal National Government has always had the necessary policy levers at its fingertips to fix some of these problems, but it has failed. And the Minister today did talk about some of the things he's done, but he hasn't mentioned what he has failed to do in these. Now, I've been the Shadow Agriculture Minister now for just over a year, and I'm really enjoying having this portfolio. Farmers, primary producers and those living in rural and regional communities have afforded me an abundance of generosity to learn not only about the products they make, but also about their lives in regional communities. But of course, I'm no stranger to this and to the ag sector, because I represent an electorate that has many fantastic primary producers in it and many regional communities. But there's been new opportunities afforded to farmers in my home state of Tasmania because of our, our, our agriculture transformation and the investments that the state and federal Labor governments did in agriculture, and I was able to be part of that. And I want to bring that expertise, that drive, that passion to the agriculture portfolio nationally to other regions right across Australia. Labor is committed to supporting farmers. We've already announced, of course, at the National Farmers Federation $500 million of our National Reconstruction Fund, especially for agriculture forestry, fisheries, food and fibre. We want to add more value here in Australia. We want to make sure that we make more here in this country again with that fund. We want to make sure that our supply chains are working, but we want to invest to make sure that we get the best possible value from our products here in our country. Of course, our Powering Australia plan will reduce Australia's emissions by 43 per cent by 2030. The plan will create over 600,000 new jobs Five out of six of those jobs will be in the regions. And as part of this policy, we've announced $8 million to encourage the development of the Australian seaweed farming industry. And we know all about the crippling workforce shortage, as I have mentioned, and we heard from the minister. And that's why Labor's announced that we'll establish Job and Skills Australia. We want a national partnership to drive to the states and the industry and the sector and work together to make sure that we have the skills and the people for the jobs for today and the jobs for the future. We're going to have 465,000 fee-free TAFE places for those areas where we have workforce shortages. We want to implement a national labour hire licensing scheme to make sure that we can keep an eye on what's happening. We want 20,000 extra university places to make sure that we train the right people into the future. We also want to upgrade regional telecommunications. Our plan will establish a $400 million fund to expand multi-carrier mobile coverage along our major roads, as well as for regional homes and businesses. We want to see 80 per cent of the 3.7 million homes and premises in regional and remote communities have speeds of up to 100 megabits per second by late 2025, a very significant investment. We also, of course, have announced our Housing Australia Future Fund to build social and affordable housing, because when people move to the regions, we need to be able to make sure they can get a house and get shelter. We need to do that, and it will create jobs and build homes and change people's lives. We also have said that we'll have a disaster ready fund and we invest up to 200 million a year on mitigation projects right across our communities. We need to adapt. We need to be ready for the climate change that's coming. The government has had almost a decade, and what we have seen are failures in the areas I've highlighted. All we have now is a tired government at the 11th hour trying to make up for years of inaction and not and taking regional communities for granted. It's too little, too late, which happens to be a mantra of this government. But I want to work with you. I want to make sure that the industry and farming in Australia can reach the 100 billion by 2030. Thank you. It's
tempting to um, start these questions with an agriculture style gotcha one. Uh, anyone want to throw in the current price of fertiliser? <laughs> <laughs> We already decided yeah, we're yeah, going to yeah. do got you We'll rise above questions. it. So, All right. Quite partisan I, approach on that one. I'll start with you, David Littleproud. Uh, you made a fairly significant announcement there. Um, the future... What did you farmers call it? Guarantee. Future farmers guarantee. So uh, the government acting as guarantor for 40% of... Up. Up to a million dollars of a loan to try and get young farmers into the industry. Obviously, we know the average age of farmers roughly 62, I think. Um, so, I guess my first question around that is: land values have been skyrocketing. Um, anything from oh, I saw a story yesterday: 22 million in Victoria for a property. Um, I know that just in Yass, just outside of Canberra. Uh, 36 hectares of land is worth, not even really commercial land, worth around 1.4 million. What's this actually going to get a farmer? And is it just a foot in the door for hobby farmers? No, it's not, because you have to repay it. Uh, and the banks will make that determination. But it is effectively be... a subsidy, isn't it? Well, normally, uh, I get to answer the questions. Uh, I've got two minutes. Uh, that's normally how this works. Uh, so land, your land, uh, in which you have in a property, is limited by its production capacity. Uh, and therefore, the forces of economics come into play. Uh, and therefore, if you go to a commercial bank, as I worked for one for 20 years, uh, you have to be able to repay it. But what the challenge is, is for many young people, even people, the men and women out there that are fighting hard, that are leasing country, that are, that are basically just having a red hot crack in agriculture. And this isn't for somebody to just walk off the street. This is for someone that has experience, that has a deposit, part of the deposit themselves. But this is just a helping hand to get them over the line. Uh, they haven't quite got that last balance to get them there. So it has to be repaid. So the forces of economics will, will actually dictate how far this goes. Uh, so this is a pilot that we want to look at in 18 months and go, let's put the ruler over this. And has this shifted the dial? Has this helped Angus and his fiancée to have a crack? Has this helped the poor, poor bloke down in Tasmania that's leasing country and, and running some cows? And just that last bit to give him a deposit and his wife a deposit to have a go. What's wrong with that? That's a, an effective use of Australian capital. Uh, we've got the agri-start alone that hasn't shifted the dial. So we're not sitting stagnant. We're going, let's try and address this problem. Because what I don't want to see is big corporates and foreign companies coming in and taking out the opportunity for succession to take place, where the son or daughter wants to have that go, to get a go. And we've stood in the way. We've taken away that opportunity. This is just, this is just using the tools that are available, using them effectively and trying to get a return on investment for the Australian taxpayer. Most importantly, most importantly, to Australian agriculture. This is about bringing our young people home. We've lost too many of them, and this is an opportunity for them to have a go. And given it could be perceived as a subsidy, how do you think it could affect relationships with trading partners? Of the 37 OECD countries, there is only one country in the world that subsidises their farmers less than us. Uh, so we obviously put this through the lens of our trade limitations and what we're trying to do, because trade is such an important part. Uh, this isn't a subsidy. This is about making sure that we give the opportunity that we're already doing in some respects with the Regional Investment Corporation. But using that capital, that $75 million, more effectively, getting a better return for the Australian taxpayer, because we're actually not deploying it. It only gets called upon, only gets called upon if there's a default. And that's why if we work with the financial institutions, I've got to say, have been very, very proactive in making sure that we put in place a mechanism that has protections, but also creates the opportunity. OK, good to hear you getting along with the banks then. Julie Collins, will this be something that Labor will support or carry through if you win government? Well, obviously, we've just heard about it today, Lucy. We'd need to have a good look at the details but on to the see exactly what the government's proposing here. Uh, on the surface of it, my first natural instincts don't trust a former banker on some of these things, to be honest. Um, but look, we'll Better have a look at the detail. Fishing. We'll have we'll have a look at the detail of it and uh, see. But I think that David's got a point in that there are a lot of farming families, and farming as a family, um, you know, is is something that my husband's family did. So I perfectly understand that this needs to be about supporting those family, fam family, fam uh, 
family farms, <laughs> and uh, looking after uh, people, particularly in regional communities, to make sure that they can get a farm. We have got increased prices for land, and I think we need to be really careful that what we're not doing here is replicating some of the other financial services that are already being provided by some of our financial institutions in these areas. So we'll have a good look at it. I just want to pick you up on something you said there. You said you'd look at the details. We have been hearing that quite a bit from you in your role as Shadow Agriculture Minister, particularly recently mm -hmm. in the lead up to the election, during this election campaign, we've been hearing that you will have more to say on Labor's agriculture policies. Thank you for your speech, uh, but with all respect, there wasn't a new announcement. We didn't hear anything that we haven't heard from you before. What can you tell farmers who might be listening or watching, to, watching today? What can you tell people in the ag sector about a policy that you, as the Shadow Agriculture Minister, have been personally crafting or personally working on? What can well, you tell well of course, you heard that from Anthony Albanese, and I, uh, I talked about it today with the Reconstruction Fund, the National Reconstruction Fund. This is really serious money. It's half a billion dollars. It's about adding value to our products here in Australia. It's about making sure that our supply chains are working here in Australia. It's about making more in this country again. $500 million is incredibly significant. There are only a few sectors which are having access to the National Reconstruction Fund. We're specifically quarantining half a billion dollars, $500 million for agriculture, forestry, fisheries, food and fibre. From a it's, a very significant, fund. it's a very significant amount of money and it's about making sure that we value add and we do more with our products here in Australia that will benefit farmers, it will add value for farmers and it will ensure that more people can get a job in a regional community. During the last election, Labor had a policy of phasing out live sheep exports. Yep. Will you do that? Are you committing to that? Well, of course, uh, we have been waiting to see what the government's going to be doing about uh, the northern uh, summer sheep trade. Um, the government, of course, had a draft report. That draft report clearly said that they should not relax the northern summer ban, and now we've had a decision from government uh, just a week or so ago, just before caretaker mode, saying that they are actually going to reduce or relax the summer ban for two weeks for certain sheep to go to certain places. Uh, I understand that decision was made by a department official we haven't seen that final report. That report is not due until June. Uh, so we were waiting for that detail, but obviously now in an election we will need to say something prior to polling day and we will be doing that. It's funny what because we want your, to do... one of your Labor colleagues, Brian Mitchell, um, in Lyons is publicly saying he supports a phasing out of live sheep exports, yet you're not... You, you, you don't have a position on this yet? Well, we're going to be making an announcement about a broader animal welfare policy later on in the campaign. I mean, uh, this is a long campaign. We've had Scott Morrison do a Malcolm Turnbull and call a long campaign on us. We've got plenty of time left, Lucy, in the campaign to be able to make those things. But the interesting but thing about the live sheep export is, of course, is, is that it has been reducing. Uh, you go back to 2019, it was 1.1 million sheep. It's now just over half a million sheep. It is already reducing and transitioning now. Uh, and we see that already. Uh, the majority of the sheep are coming out of Western Australia, as I understand it, and going to the Middle East. Uh, we will have more to say broadly about animal welfare. Uh, we want to have a look at the detail. But I mean, I would say to the minister about how has, on the eve of caretaker, the government made this decision about the northern summer ban? Let me, and let me and help quite frankly, um, uh, Labor is opposed to that relax, minute. relaxing that ban. Uh, I'm happy to help Julie out here, which is quite frightening. But what she doesn't understand is it's not my decision. It's not the government's decision. It's an independent regulator that makes that decision. If you want to be the Australian Agriculture Minister, you might want to invest some time in understanding the structures and processes that take place. This is an independent decision predicated on science by a body that makes that decision, not a minister, we don't have the not final a politician. Report. This is, this is we don't have an independent body. So if you want to be the Australian the Agriculture Minister, mode, you want to actually understand the process. The closest you've been to a farm is 30,000 feet as you've oh, flown over true. them. I mean, 435 days, Seriously. two visits outside a capital city. Let me tell you, this is serious business. This is an it $80 billion dollar industry. These are people's livelihoods. This is Angus's livelihood that we are talking about. And if you don't understand the premise of what you are doing here, then you are at real risk to this nation. You are at real risk to regional Australia. You are at real this risk ridiculous. to driving up Come the on. cost of living to every Australian. Seriously, David, you want to get personal stuff like that, really? I mean, this is ridiculous. 
If you want to get personal, I'm happy to go personal, and I'm happy to talk about how I grew up in poverty, how I dragged myself out of it, how I will apply that determination and that hard work to represent farmers right across this country. I'm proud of what Labor's policies are to date, and I am proud of the achievements that I have made to be able to get to this position, and I will do everything I can, if I'm fortunate enough to be Agriculture Minister, to stand up for farmers. I absolutely understand what's happened here, and you do too, and a decision has been made without the final report coming out in June. Labor does not support a relaxation of the Northern Summer Ban when it comes to live sheep. Sadly, sadly Julie, this is personal. It's personal because this is about people's livelihoods. The people yes, that is. I represent... The Which people is something we've heard I, you no, say no, before, Mr Moore Proud. I'm going to wrap you up say, there I, I and we're going to go straight that. to questions from the floor. First up, we have Julie Hare from the Fin Review and the National Press Club. Thank you. Julie Hare from the Financial Review and the National Press Club. Thank you, Lucy. Um, this is to both of you. Um, I'd ask you to take turns. Last year, the National Skills Commission identified for the first time ever the skill shortages were higher and more persistent in regional areas than in cities. Mm. These skill shortages are not just farm workers and in mining, right. but doctors, nurses, accountants, tradies, chefs, teachers, aged care workers and disability workers. It goes right across the board. I'd like to know from each of you what your plans for the next five years is to deal with this, considering that cities are also dealing with school shortages, and ask you the question whether it's sustainable or desirable that we simply import these people on a dazzling array of visas. Thank you. Julie Collins. Uh, thanks, uh, Julie, for the question, and Lucy. Um, we have, as I outlined in my earlier speech, we have said that we will build Jobs and Skills Australia. We want to work with sectors and industries and make sure, and states and territories to make sure that we do have the skilled Australians, that we train Australians again for the jobs that we need today, that we need in five years, 10 years and 20 years. We need to be ahead of the innovation and the jobs of the future, but we also need to deal with the jobs shortages today. Uh, we understand completely that some short-term temporary workers are required, but what that's required because after nine years years, we haven't trained enough Australians. There are now 80-odd thousand fewer apprentices and trainees in this country than there was when Labor left office. There has been billions ripped out of the training and vet sectors across the country. Uh, we want to reinvest. We want to have more places in TAFE. We want to have more places in university, and we want to train Australians for the jobs that we need today and into the future. But you can only do it working with sectors and industry about identifying exactly what are those shortages, what is the best way to get workers out into the field as quickly as possible? And how do we keep workers in those industries? How do we make those industries, uh, you know, viable into the future? How do we, you know, attract people into agriculture? How do we attract people into some of these areas that traditionally people are not thinking about when they're in schools? And that's about having better vet in schools. It's about working with the states and territories and making sure that we train Australians for the jobs because that hasn't happened enough over the last decade and Labor wants to turn that around. But I just make the point that Australians don't seem to want to work in regional Australia. Well, that's not true at the moment. We've got plenty of people moving to regional Australia. Uh, certainly that's not the experience that I've had. I've been talking to lots of farmers who are doing innovative things to get locals to work for them on farms, whether it be to pick fruit, whether it to be doing other higher level jobs and training people. But we do that by making agriculture an exciting opportunity and career pathway for people. And we can only do that by working with the sector and the industry to make sure we get it right and we attract the right people into the sector. Thank you, Minister, your rebuttal to that? Well, it's both. Uh, and we are going to continue to have to rely on foreign labour. Uh, there, is no, there is no two ways about that. We're a growing nation and we need to continue. And we need to understand what that's created for our country. And that's why the ag visa uh, isn't just about unskilled. It's actually about skilled and semi-skilled as well. And giving a pathway to permanent residency, bringing the next generation of migrants to build agriculture and to big re build regional Australia. That's the biggest structural shift we've seen. But we will continue to invest in the training. And it's not just Big Bad Canberra's fault. This is also the lays the responsibility of much of the states as well. I can tell you, in my home state of Queensland, we've lost every one of our agricultural colleges that were helping to build that next generation of workers on our properties and on our farms and our agricultural sector. They've walked away from it. We've, as I said earlier, we've put, over, uh, we've put reduction in our university courses by 59 per cent. Agricultural, uh, agricultural courses seen a significant impact straight away. So this is about us working and making sure there's accountability at all levels, ensuring we're working with the states to make sure that those traineeships, those apprenticeships are taken up 
and the opportunities there. And we've continued to do that with, with incentives for, for young people to take that up. My son has, in fact, taken one up himself, a school-based apprenticeship as a diesel mechanic at an agricultural business in Warwick. Uh, and he, he's been the beneficiary of, of an assistance package that we put out there to incentivise him to stay in the regions. Uh, but we've also put in these things called country university centres. And these are great things. There was a little place called Deer and Bandy, a little girl from Deer and Bandy, finished year 12, year 10 at Deer and Bandy, busted to St George for year 11 and 12, three hour round trip. And now she's doing nursing in Deer and Bandy at a country university centre and is going to get a job at the Deer and Bandy hospital. That's about us investing in the infrastructure, but making sure we're partnering and the accountability is held there, not just at a federal level, but at a state level as well. Just while we're waiting for Jess Malcolm from The Australian to come up, um, just a quick question following up from the Ag Visa. No commitment from Labor to keeping or scrapping it today? Well, of course, there's no workers currently in the country on the Ag Visa, and the Minister likes to say it's his legacy. I mean, this quick was question, promised though, three keeping years it or ago. Scrapping it? As we heard from Fiona, three years of promises. There's still nobody here in Australia. There's an MOU signed with Vietnam. We don't know the detail of that MOU. Labor will be making announcements in relation to visas later on in the campaign. Okay. So we'll be doing that later on in the campaign. But this Ag Visa, let's be very clear, there are no workers in Australia today. It is not a silver bullet. We need to do the other things I've talked about, about training Australia as well. Okay, thank you. Jess Malcolm from The Australian. Thank you both for your time today. Um, just on the Ag Visa, Ms Collins, do you think Labor's foggy position on the Ag Visa is going to hurt you in regional Australia at this federal election? And Minister Little Proud, just a separate question. Um, the Nats are facing a threat from several pro-climate candidates um, in the election. Do you think you've done enough to sell your message on climate? You want me to go first? In terms of the agriculture visa, Labor will be putting out policies further into the campaign on this, as I said. I'm very proud of Labor's policies to date, and I'm very proud of the policies that I've been working on with my colleague, Christina Keneally, in relation to visas. We need to make sure that when people come to this country that they're paid appropriately, that they're looked after, and that we clean out some of the issues, which is why we want to um, do the licensing of the Labor hire companies. We need to make sure that people coming over here who may be vulnerable are protected, and so that they send a good message so that more workers want to come to Australia to be able to do this. Uh, we've had the minister to talk about a pathway to permanency. We've got two ministers who are in disagreement about that. Uh, we've had you know, the, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade say that that hasn't yet been worked through. There's no detail about what this plan uh, pathway to permanency looks like. So you know, we will have more to say, and um, I think that uh, regional Australians and farmers generally will be very pleased with Labor's policies as we go forward. Does that mean you won't support it? I, I think the farmers and regional Australians will be very pleased with Labor's policies. David Little proud that question about the pro-climate independence and the Nats. I think the National Party has shown quite explicitly that we believe that there's a changing climate and we want to make sure that farmers are at the centre of that. It's a National Party minister that created a world first biodiversity stewardship program. A National Party minister. It wasn't anyone else. It wasn't the Greens. It wasn't the Labor. It wasn't Liberal. It was a National Party minister that saw the opportunity that farmers could participate and be part of the solution. Instead of footing the bill that they did last time for us to get to Kyoto and for us to get to Paris and weren't compensated for a property right taken away, a premise that should be foreign to every Australian, but one in which Australian farmers copped. And what we've said is let's think differently about that. Let's get the best and brightest in this country to think differently about how farmers can be part of the solution. And that's why a biodiversity stewardship program, being the first country in the world to be able to measure it, this intellectual property is now sought after around the world. And we created here with the best minds in the world. And what we wanted to do is plug it in, plug it in to what the existing carbon farming program is. And what the other opportunity that will lay ahead is when soil carbon comes online, that it can be plugged in. And this isn't about the Australian taxpayer having to pay for this. This is about us standing up and saying that corporate Australia, who want to be able to report every year in their annual reports, ESG requirements and how they've stood there, that they haven't gone and bought an acre of the Amazon They've got the best science in the world that's going to back that their investment in Australian farmers gives them the return that they should have to their shareholders. And we've put in place a safeguard so that we don't get people that come in and undertake a perverse outcome of buying up whole tracts of land and then walking away and taking the money with them without the management of the landscape, which we've already seen. 
So we've got practical measures to make sure this doesn't become an, um, another MIS scheme, but incentivise farmers to actually look at the unproductive landscape and to have that passive income that the NFF is talking about. That's a world first. That's the National Party. Thank you. Kath Sullivan from the ABC and from the National Rural Press Club. Thanks, Luce, and thanks to the Shadow Minister and Minister. Um, a couple of really quick ones. You shouldn't take, take up all of your time. Um, now, my understanding for short is answers, isn't that it? <laughs> um, the department has been briefing um, groups about the new agriculture visa. Um, let's not expect anybody to arrive from Vietnam until we can set the tax rate um, for the Pacific what the PALM, the Pacific Australia Labor Mobility, and for the new agriculture visa. If that's the case, which side of the parliament decided not to hear that legislation in the dying days of the parliament? And another really quick one, could you each tell us when the last time you visited a working farm was? Julie Collins. Yep. So in terms of the legislation, uh, it obviously was not prioritised by the government in terms of the program. The government sets the sitting schedule for federal parliament. It did not prioritise this legislation. There was a heap of legislation that the government needed to get through in a hurry, including the budget bills. It needed to get the budget bills through both houses within a day. Uh, the Tuesday and night was the budget. Wednesday it needed to get both bills through. And then there was a whole heap of other legislation the government also wanted to get through and just race through the parliament. And we said, you've got to have a proper process for all of this legislation. You need to prioritise it. It's the government that sets the agenda for parliament. It's the government that says what priority legislation is. There are plenty of pieces of agriculture legislation that didn't get through the parliament before parliament was dissolved, and the government should take responsibility for that. That is the government's issue, totally the government's issue. We do not set the parliamentary agenda, the government does. We don't, as an opposition. Let me be very clear about that. The rest of the question? When were you last on a working farm? Uh, last week with Susan uh, Templeman in uh, the Hawkesbury. So look, uh, that's not necessarily correct. So what happens at the end of the last parliamentary sitting? There is a whole list of legislation that we sit down, and it's not all argy-bargy in the Parliament House. We actually sit there and go, look at the legislative agenda. What are the things that have a bipartisan approach? What are the things that we all agree on that we can guillotine debate with some of the extremities on both the left side and the right side that we don't necessarily always want to hear from? What are the ones that we can agree on as an opposition and, we've and a government? And we supported this legislation. We said we'd support this well, hold legislation. On, just, I right, gave you the respect. So. It's mutual sometimes. And were you agreed as a coalition? No, no, no. no. Can I just... I'd, I'd like to answer the question, please. Um, so yeah, what we do great. is the Senate, the Senate leaders sat down, sat down with Penny Wong and said, these are the legislations that we want to push through and guillotine debate. Because if you have the debate, it just takes too long and we don't get through as many bills as what we want. And so part of that was a piece of legislation that would take the tax rate, as it is for backpackers, to, for an agricultural visa worker that came in, from 32 and a half cents down to 15 cents. The Labor Party said, no, we're not going to allow that to be guillotined. We won't allow that to happen. There were heaps and after the demonisation of, of their political of their the parliament parliament without the after the demonisation by their political masters, the AWU, that walked into embassies and high commissions and spoke to amb ambassadors and said, don't allow your citizens to come to Australia because they'll be exploited. The hypocrisy to sit there with a bill that would have meant that the tax rate was reduced and was equitable to everyone else is the most brazen piece, brazen piece of, of hypocrisy I've ever seen. This was an opportunity to send the signal, the signal to Vietnam, a sovereign country that wants to send its citizens here, that signed up as a sovereign country and send a signal to say, no, I'm not going to do that. That's more about politics than it is about good policy. All right, and when were you last on a working farm, just quickly? Uh, last Saturday, up in, up in central Queensland at a barbecue. <laughs> Our next question. Uh, Krishani Danji from SBS World News. Uh, Minister, following on from the other question on ag visas, it's obviously been five months since we were promised that there would be workers on farms. Government had previously said it would happen by the end of last year. Um, 
You've previously put the blame on the Foreign Minister and the Department of Foreign Affairs. Is that where it still stands? What, what is the blockage here? Or do you accept that there has been a bit of a failure? You've also now blamed the unions for going across to ambassadors, saying that their workers will be exploited. Isn't there a problem then if those ambassadors are hearing that and having genuine concerns? And if I may, to the Shadow Minister, um, you've said now that you uh, won't reveal whether Labor will support or carry on with an ag visa, but this visa was announced almost a year ago. Why is it taking so long for Labor to come up with a position on it? David Littlecrab. Well, I don't accept the premise of your question. That's more of a Canberra bubble question. Um, the Foreign Minister uh, has taken this up. Um, as soon as we, we put it in place on the 1st of October, in fact, she started bilaterals before then. But what's happened? is that when the AWU sat there and was talking to ambassadors, no sovereign country would not take that seriously and want more questions and, more, and to do more due diligence before they signed up. We, we respect that. Uh, but for it, for it to be sabotaged in the way that it was, I mean, what Australian organisation does that to their fellow Australian? These are family farms in many cases, and I've been on many of them, that employ foreign workers. And yes, there is a small cohort that do the wrong thing. And we need to weed them out. But like in industry, there is always ones that do the wrong thing. And that's how we, we address it. But to go and demonise Australian farmers in the way you do, to sabotage this, that's been the, the issue. I was in Indonesia and met, met with uh, my counterparts there. And they had genuine concerns about what was being purported by the AWU. Now, we're Australians. We should back ourselves fix the problem, get on with the job, provide our farmers with the opportunity, the opportunity they need. Because you know what? This is going to be the biggest cost of living pressure on every Australian. Forget fuel. Because if farmers don't have the confidence to plant, nothing gets picked. And up goes your price. ABARES was even talking over 20% increase. And you're starting to see Coles and Woolworths even talking about it now. These are investment decisions farmers have to make. And they won't make them unless they have the certainty. And what we need is Australians working with Australians, not working against one another. Julie Collins, Krishani was asking why it's taking Labor so long to say whether or not she will support the ag visa. I think what we've heard there from the Minister is after a decade, they failed to make sure that workers on farms get paid appropriately and fairly. That's what he has just admitted. They've had a decade in office and there are still issues. He admitted that there are still some issues that need to be resolved. Uh, Labor wants to look at the detail of this visa. It only went up on the website just as caretaker mode was announced. Uh, up onto the website. We have been working on a solution and we'll have more to say, but let's be clear. What we need to do is to make sure that workers on farms are not exploited, that we do have fair pay for workers on farms, that farmers uh, are able to have confidence to do their planting so that this workforce issue that has been there for a long time, and this government has had 10 years to fix it, and at the 11th hour is trying to blame somebody else for each not having done its job. That is the reality here. And Minister question, Little Proud and the government have not why, done their job. That question about why it's taking Labor so long to declare its position on the ag visa. Well, the ag visa wasn't real. That's the point. There's no workers here under it. And there was only an MOU signed recently, and the detail of it only went up on the website as caretaker mode was announced. Uh, we need time to have a look at that detail. We need time to make sure, and we've been talking to the Farmers Federation and talking to farmers, we need to make sure that we get it right, and we'll have more to say well before polling day uh, with detail about what our solution is. But we need to make sure that those workers are paid appropriately and that there is confidence in the system. As the minister himself outlined, we need to make sure that confidence exists and that farmers have confidence to plant, and we absolutely get that, and we want to give them that long-term uh, confidence that they can do that. This is obviously an immediate problem, though. Does Labor then have an alternative policy that if you were to win government, you would immediately be able to action some sort of, uh, some sort of plan for workers to come to farms? Well, I think even the government itself has admitted that the Pacific Islands scheme will remain the primary scheme. You've had the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade say that under the ag visa in the first few years there'll only be a thousand workers. So clearly this is not the solution to the, the worker shortage here. It's part of a solution. And the Pacific Islands solution in terms of uh, 
temporary workers will remain the primary scheme for getting workers to, us, to Australia to help get produce off farm, and we absolutely support that, and we absolutely uh, will have more to say around how we're going to make sure that workers are protected. Right, our next question is from Andrea Crothers from Sky. Just one for Julie Collins today. Hi. You've been described privately by industry leaders as uninformed, uninspired and unavailable. Do you think that's fair and how will you fix your ag image? Well, I'm not sure which industry people are saying that because that's certainly not what I'm hearing and that's certainly never been said to me before. That's the first time I've heard it. I've been going out of my way to talk to uh, farmers, to peak bodies, to groups, to get out on farms and to learn about the agriculture industry more than I, you know, um, or had already known from my history in the past, from working uh, with state and federal governments for being part of the agricultural transformation of Tasmania. I have a very strong and proud history of supporting agriculture, and I'll be very, very, uh, uh, very, very pleased to be able to uh, talk to farmers even more than I have been. I've been going out of my way. I've met hundreds and hundreds of peak groups and hundreds and hundreds of individual farmers since I've had this portfolio in the last year. And I'm very proud of the policies Labor's putting forward. And I, I think that the farmers will be very proud of it and regional communities will be very proud of it. What have you actually learned about agriculture? I'm learning every day, Lucy, like everybody, uh, you know, uh, talking to farmers. The main priorities that I'm hearing from farmers, their biggest concern is around climate change. And it was interesting before to hear the minister talk about climate and to get the questions uh, when we know that uh, they got dragged kicking and screaming to zero, net zero by 2050 because we know that climate has been one of the biggest impacts on farmers and that will be continuing uh, as we go forward and we need to make sure that we have adaption and mitigation. One thing that a lot of farmers have expressed concern about is Labor's position on water buybacks in the Murray-Darling Basin, the remaining 450 gigalitres to be returned to the environment. Do you support buybacks when it comes to that water? Well, what we want to do, Lucy, is just make sure that the Murray-Darling Agreement, as it was originally agreed, is delivered on. We want to make sure that all of the communities in the Murray-Darling, the farmers and those regional communities, uh, get what was agreed to. We need to make sure that the agreement is adhered to. Uh, what we want to do with that, of course, is, is to talk to people. We want to make sure there's more transparency in the system. We want to invest more in the science because we think that if there's more transparency around what is happening in the Murray-Darling system, people will understand better exactly what's happening with that. Um, we, we don't want to see um, anybody disadvantaged. We want to work with those communities. We want to make sure uh, that the original agreement is delivered on. Do you, as the Shadow Agriculture Minister, believe that buying back irrigators water is the right way to do that? Obviously, Lucy, we want to be able to negotiate this. We, we, like, we, we want to be able to work with those communities and work with those farmers to make sure that the original agreement is delivered on. Our preference is to work with people and make sure we get there. Can I have a right reply on that? Because I'm a former water minister. Let me tell you, the agreement has been upheld. Because I was the one that put in place the Northern Basin Review, the sustainable diversion limits, and negotiated the 450 uh, with the states. It has been delivered. It's locked and loaded. The states have agreed. Yep. To sit there and to try and open up 450 and to say that the way to do that is through buybacks doesn't just destroy Australian agriculture. It destroys communities right up and down the Murray-Darling. We've seen that already with the buybacks that have taken place. The 450 is locked and loaded. The states agreed, even South Australia. I got that agreement yep. in December 2018. Sure deliver on it. All that we need done now to deliver the plan. 80% of the plan is complete. The last 20% is around building the infrastructure, using the smarts to return that water to the environment, not a blunt instrument that destroys livelihoods and destroys regional Australia. That's the smarts of a smart country. That's what we put in place and that's what we will make sure is delivered. All right, Simon Crothers from Canberra IQ. Uh, Simon Groves from... No, sorry. <laughs> uh, My apologies. Half right. Um, uh, I'd like to invite you to take a break from the little bun fight you're talking about, and uh, let's talk about the, the major conflict going on in the world at the moment. And uh, uh, let's look at it through the, um, the prism of Australian wheat farmers and uh, uh, people in third world countries who are dependent on imported wheat. Mm. and subsidised wheat. Um, I was amazed to discover that Russia and the Ukraine are responsible for about 30% of, uh, of exported wheat. Mm. Right. Their, their harvest is due to start in less than three months. If they can get it off, they may not be able to get it out through the Black Sea. Um, 
And um, I've seen predictions that uh, the Australian wheat price, the, or, sorry, the global wheat price could uh, be um, could rise over 50% above for what it was at the start of the year. Um, I figure also for farmers, their costs will rise. So I'm, I'm interested in your reflections on the, the implications for Australian wheat farmers, but also we're seeing early predictions of a food crisis, uh, a global food crisis, as uh, so many countries can't get wheat. Uh, do you have any idea about the, the prospects of that? Let's start with you, David Littleproud. Yeah, and look, uh, Australian wheat farmers uh, are sadly the beneficiary of that conflict, and they don't want to be that beneficiary in where the price is at the moment. It's over well north of 450, 460, 470 bucks the last time I looked. And when I was a bank manager, if you got 250 a tonne, you're probably doing pretty well. Uh, and that's not what farmers want to take advantage of, but it's geopolitical issues that, that they now have to face. So you know, we're obviously, as part of a global community, going to work with that global community, not just supporting Ukraine. Uh, and making sure that they're supported either with lethal aid but also with food aid. But we're going to have to look and work more broadly uh, around the global community and support that may be required there as we, as we get a lens on this very fluid situation. And, and so we're alive to that and we're working through that as best we can. With respect to agricultural inputs, and that's been the kicker on the other side. Uh, we made an investment through the Northern Australia Infrastructure Fund uh, to build a facility up in Western Australia, a $4.5 billion facility that will produce about 2.4 million tonnes of urea fertiliser every year, which is equates to about 96% of what we currently import, uh, which will give some sovereign capability. But I've got to say, as an old bank manager, I was part of the, the reason why there isn't sovereign capability here, because I used to sit around kitchen tables and we'd do budgets. And we were at stages where farmers would, would buy urea or inputs, two or three bucks cheaper a tonne from overseas than a, than a local producer because they were making tough decisions. And that's eroded the investment confidence. Because if you're going to produce a manufacturing plant, two or three billion dollars worth, you've got to have confidence that the market's going to support you. So some of that is, is legacy that we need to work through. And we're making those investments, whether they be with NAIF or our modern manufacturing $1.3 billion program, to try and give that sovereign capability. And But it comes back, if we get that sovereign capability, we as Australians have got to look at supporting Australian businesses and particularly supporting Australian manufacturers. Julie Collins, what's your response to this? Yeah, um, in terms of uh, the impact on wheat farmers, I'm sure like David has been talking to, to wheat growers across the country and they're certainly telling us that uh, whilst they are benefiting from some of the prices, that some of them also have contracts locked in at, at lower prices than the current price. They're also telling us that their inputs are getting higher, uh, both fertiliser and fuel um, have been higher. So they are very concerned about uh, this shortage. I mean, I, I understand I've heard the same figures you have, 25 to 30 per cent of the wheat, uh, global wheat supplies comes from those two countries. So this is a very concerning situation. And David's right, we do need to work with global partners. Uh, we need to sit down and we need to have a discussion about how we're going to fill uh, that extra 25 to 30 per cent of wheat across the world and what that looks like. Uh, because what we don't want to see is this impact on uh, developing countries particularly, uh, but also obviously those people in Ukraine who are struggling to get food supplies into there now. Uh, it has been very, very difficult and we do need to work together with our partners, uh, particularly in the OECD, to make sure that we can fill that void. Jamison Murphy from Australian Commun Community Media and Farm Online. G'day. Thank you both. Um, I wanted to ask about ag visas, but I don't think we're going to till any new ground there. So I'll pivot to biosecurity. Mm -hmm. um, Julie, you've been critical of the government's handling of biosecurity. That's fair enough. But what would you do differently specifically? I'd like to hear the details of your biosecurity policy. And David, um, you've copped a bit of heat recently over biosecurity funding. Um, your response was that a lot of the sideline critics within the agriculture community were ignorant of the science. A lot of them are meeting with the same people that are advising you, and I think that comment took them by surprise. Uh, they've come away from these meetings quite concerned, um, hence the criticism of the funding. Could you elaborate on why these critics are ignorant of the biosecurity situation? Julie Collins. Yeah, thank you. Obviously, uh, the biosecurity issue has been very is, is very serious, and you know we've got lumpy skin disease, and uh, obviously. The, 
well, we hope we don't have it, but we've, we, we've got it right on our doorstep. Uh, and we need to do more to make sure that we don't get that come into Australia. It's a very serious issue. And what we've had is we've had three Inspector General reports. We've had one Auditor General report, all in the last 18 months, say that our biosecurity system is not fit for purpose. Until last year's budget, not the one just gone, but the one before, biosecurity funding was going backwards. Of course, the government did announce back in 2018 a biosecurity levy that it then dumped in, in 2019. Um, I have been on the record to say that what Labor wants to do um, if we're successful at the election is to work to make sure that we have long-term sustainable funding for biosecurity. Uh, I've heard the minister say a similar thing. I mean, they have had years in government and the resources of government in terms of biosecurity to come up with a plan for this. The minister has said that it will be released shortly. I don't know if it's still going to be released or if they've got a plan to announce before the election themselves in terms of long-term uh, funding sustainability for biosecurity. Um, Labor will have more to say in terms of biosecurity uh, between now and election day. Uh, we are concerned uh, that our biosecurity system is not fit for purpose. We are concerned that there are issues. And I think that all of us in this room understand that this is a huge risk to Australia. This is a huge risk to our $80 billion industry. Uh, if we get one of these uh, diseases come in, uh, you know, the capra beetle or, you know, the lumpy skin disease, the African swine flu, like these could really, really, swine fever, they could really impact Australia and our trade relations. They could impact our farmers' bottom line. We need to do everything we can to make sure our biosecurity system is up to date, that it's world's best practice and that it is fit for purpose. And we want to make sure that that happens. And if we win government, we want to work with industry to make sure that that's the case. David Littleproud, can you elaborate on yeah. why you think farm groups... Well, Jamison, I call it as I see it. And leadership isn't just asking for more money. It's about knowing specifically what you're going to do with that money. Because this is your money. This is Australian taxpayers' money I'm spending. And I get advised by those same people, but I've got specifics. They give me specifics about how your dollar should be spent. What is the shift that I need to spend in biosecurity spend through the evolving threat that's coming there? So when I'm going to spend your money, I'm going to make sure it gets a return on that money. I'm going to make sure that we have the technology, a shift to more technology, 3D X-ray scanners, more boots on the ground, more paws on the ground, more robots, Labrador robots, could you believe it? This is also making sure we have intelligence, understanding where containers have come and gone from. This isn't just flimsy saying we want billions of billions of dollars more. Right. That doesn't solve the problem. What solves the problem is science and leadership and being honest. And that's what I am. I've been honest with you all the way along. And I've got to say, Inspector General report. We didn't wait for Inspector General's reports. But I'm going to say we've got one of the best Inspector Generals in the world. And unfortunately, he's moving on and, we'll make, and we've made an appointment of a new one. But we didn't wait for his report to come back. There was regulatory maturity to know that we needed more money invested in the technology because the threat was evolving. As it came across the Middle East, into Asia, now in Southeast Asia, on our doorstep, we've had to change our focus. But $1.1 billion worth of investment. And yes, we will go back to a user pay system. But there was this little thing called COVID. And while Australian agriculture has gone from when I started about $47 billion to now $80 billion, there were many industries in this country that were on their knees and you spent a lot of money in this little thing called JobKeeper. We wanted to keep people employed. We need to keep the economy going because we had to pay the bills. And yes, we'll move back to that model, but we're doing the right thing by having an economy that's the envy of the world because we manage this thing better than anybody. Thank you. Amanda Kopp from National Radio News. Hello, I'm Anne Kopp from National Radio News and the Community Radio Network. Um, the Australian fertiliser industry is heavily reliant on imports and costs have skyrocketed during COVID. Um, one of the major suppliers of fertiliser domestically is closing down at the end of next year, um, citing gas supply issues. Um, what are you doing to secure domestic supply of fertiliser? And given that the industry has a very high energy intensity, how will you help transition that particular industry to renewables? Julie Collins. 
Thanks. So obviously we're not in government at the moment. There's an election campaign on. Uh, I don't have the resources of the department uh, like David does in terms of what will you do today. But we have announced our National Reconstruction Fund that I've talked about, which will look at these supply chains, which will look at investing in the manufacturing of some of this stuff domestically to make sure that we do have enough supply here in Australia. The one thing that we all learnt from COVID was, of course, our supply chains is not as robust as they can be or should be. Uh, of course, we've had our farmers and our primary producers doing a terrific job during COVID to make sure that we're all fed and that we're getting everything we need. But we are aware of the shortages. Uh, they have been highlighted, not just in terms of the fertiliser, but in a whole heap of other industries. That's why we need a National Reconstruction Fund. That's why we need to invest in the supply chain. That's why we need to make more here in Australia and we need to manufacture more here in Australia. And that's what our National Reconstruction Fund is all about, making sure that that can happen, making sure that we are partner with industry, that we make sure that uh, the settings are right, that the government levers are all being pulled in the right direction to invest to make sure that we build and and produce more here in our country. So we want to be able to do that with the National Reconstruction Fund. That is the whole point of it. Um, we need to make sure that those supply chains are, are able to continue, particularly during times as we've seen in the last few years, where we know it's been such a huge issue. David Little Proud, you did touch on this earlier. Can yeah. you, can I, you go I won't further? go over the old ground of what we what we're doing there, but but some of the, the investment confidence was lacking of that particular investor who's moving out of Brisbane and taking their operation to the United States. And that was because they didn't have the confidence of, of support here. And the cost of energy, obviously, is, is the other leading factor to that. But understand, we've also made sure that we've opened up supply chains around the world when we had even issues with AdBlue. We've got good trading nations that we've been able to call on at an instant, whether that be for fertiliser, whether that be for AdBlue or other things. Uh, Indonesia, uh, Japan, Korea, we've been able to go quickly into those, into those markets and be able to secure the supply. What shipping companies are telling us is there's probably another 12 months at least of disruption in those shipping lines. So that's going to exacerbate the problem. There is no quick fix to this, and I think anyone that thinks they are is, is telling you a furphy. The reality is it's going to take time, one, to get our supply chains back to some normality, and that's probably 12 months, as they say. And then it's about trying to give that investor confidence to build that, that sovereign capability. And that's what we're trying to do in, in making sure that those investors will go forward, whether it be for urea or other agricultural inputs. Another concern I've got to say with agricultural inputs is the challenges we're facing around the world and pushback, particularly from European countries, about our agricultural production systems, the use of things like glyphosate. Now, glyphosate's not necessarily a bad thing. And in fact, there's even been some in the environmental sector that says that if we don't have we don't use things like glyphosate can actually have a detrimental impact on our environment and our native species. So it's important we get the balance right. And I, in fact, I see Sue McCluskey here today. We put on a, an agricultural special representative to go and to articulate why the science should back the production systems that we have. And then what we need to do is have that long boat into bringing back sovereign capability and giving that investment confidence. But that's not just government, that's industry as well, working hand in hand and saying, we're gonna back an Aussie. And that's the way that we see uh, the long road back to sovereign capability. And we're doing that with modern manufacturing, the knife and any other vehicle uh, that we can find. Just before we go to your closing statements, I have one question for Minister Littleproud. The National Party leadership is declared vacant after every federal election. Who do you think should fill the vacancy? So is my leadership. Who do you think should fill the vacancy of the leadership well, of the National Party? The National Party has a very special culture. Uh, where both at, at the end of every election, both the leader and the deputy leader's position is spilled. Um, that's a conversation we have within our, in our party room. The sovereignty of our party room is something that we guard very fiercely. Um, it's what makes us unique. It makes us nationals. Because all we want to represent are regional rural Australians. There's enough politicians running around in capital cities. Would a spell so, in opposition be good for your leadership aspirations? No, it wouldn't be good for Australia. What, what would be bad for Australia? is that you have, you have a new government that's going to spend a bit of loose change uh, on infrastructure, a bit of loose change on telecommunications, where you've got a government that's put forward a budget. It's a legal document. We're telling you how, we, how you're going to help pay for it because we're empowering you. We're giving you the tools to repay debt. It'll be you that creates the jobs. That'll be the biggest risk to this country. It's not about the National Party. And for us, it's about that one third of the population that live out there that I represent, that I've never lived outside of and never want to live in a capital city. 
I'm proud to say that. And that's the legacy that our government has left, despite the challenges that we faced up to. There has been no government that's faced up the challenges that we have, the variety and scale, since the Second World War. Instead of this self-loathing, we should put our chest out as Australians and say we did a bloody good job. We're the envy of the world, and those that want to knock us, even our own, should bugger off. All right, I'll ask you both to put your chests out and give us your closing statements. Uh, we'll start with you, Julie Collins. Uh, thanks, Lucy. What I want to say to farmers and those living in regional and rural communities is, is that we have got the policies, we have got uh, the, the announcements that we have made to date with regional communications, regional housing, uh, the National Reconstruction Fund, our jobs and skills. We want to invest in regional communities, but regional communities are not just about those types of investments and the infrastructure that are required in them. They're actually about people. They're about making sure that people can go to work every day, that we can deliver the produce to the cities, that we make sure that uh, those communities are vibrant and healthy. And that includes other services, things like cheaper childcare, things like aged care services, things like strengthening Medicare. We need to make sure that those communities are viable, that people can live in them and work in them. What we don't need is another three years of this tired, decade-old government. What we don't need is a government that has sat on its laurels and not dealt with things like climate change. What we don't need is Scott Morrison and Barnaby Joyce running the country for another three years. David Littleproud. Well, Lucy, I'm just a bloke from Western Queensland with a year 12 education. And I'm proud to live in a country that's given me an opportunity to sit at the biggest boardroom in the table, in the country, and to be able to change the lives, to leave a legacy for the next generation, to right that wrong, to bring them home, to bring our young people back to regional and rural Australia, to believe in regional and rural Australia and what we do and how we do it. We should never be told by anybody anybody, that we don't do it better than anyone else. We should be loud and proud about it, and regardless what happens to me, regardless what happens, the one thing that I worry about is the legacy that's left behind for Angus and his fiancée, for those young men and women that want to have the courage and conviction of their own sweat and their own wallet to have a go. That's what this country is built on. I'm proud to represent regional Australia, and that's all I want to represent. Thanks for having me. And a big thank you to both our speakers on behalf of the National Press Club and the Rural Press Club, David Littleproud and Julie Collins. Thank you so much for your time today. It's great to have a robust spirited discussion, so thank you. The contest of ideas is real, clearly. We have a lovely little treasure for you both to take away, gold membership to the Press Club. get to come up drinks with you is that what you're saying <laughs> <laughs> thank you all <laughs>